Activate Your Introvert, the weekly show to help leaders build performance by understanding introversion. In this week's show, thinking about time management, if you've got the time, a discussion with Claire Kumar. Claire is a highly sensitive executive coach, guiding professionals towards sustainable performance through greater productivity and well-being. Question of the week, how can I be better at managing introverts? Just before speaking to Claire, have you been hit by the wordle craze? Seeing people post their daily word game pictures on social media has been driving me potty, even though I enjoy the game. But it was in the news recently for a different reason, where Wordle was credited with saving the life of a Chicago woman that got imprisoned in her home for 20 hours. The 80-year-old had got into the habit of texting her score to her eldest daughter each day. One day, she failed to text. Her daughter alerted a neighbour, who got no answer at the door, and alerted the police. They found the woman in the bathroom where an intruder had locked her up. The suspect has been charged with assault and home invasion, So maybe I should go easier on Wordle posts on social media. But then again, is Wordle just a needless distraction? One of life's problems is spending time on what we don't need to do rather than we do need to do. Often we call it time management. And I've got no idea why, but several client discussions recently have focused on time management. Is it different for introverts? Yes, time management is different for introverts. Firstly though, let's deal with the big issue. Time management is impossible. You cannot manage time, so save yourself the time and don't bother. You can only manage yourself. So let's focus on on that. Not only do we need to manage our interaction with time, but also our energy levels, and that's where introverts may need to think differently. Block out some time to recharge energy, or encourage your introverts to do just that. And that possibly does not involve joining extroverted colleagues for noisy banter by the coffee machine. The extroverts might get energised by that, but probably not the introverts, who might prefer a five-minute walk outside every couple of hours. So don't just block out time for tasks, block out time for recharging. Stereotypically, introverts like detail, though that doesn't mean they're any better at planning. Planning the day or the meeting is something we all need to do more of. Saying no is one of the big self-management things when it comes to getting things done on time. Many people take on too much, so say no politely in view of your priorities and provide an alternative where possible. Maybe a to-don't list is the most appropriate thing for you to consider this week. And my other favourite tip is having a resume plan. When you're interrupted mid-task, and don't even start me on multitasking, create a resume plan. A couple of sentences about where you were, what you were about to do next, and what you were struggling with. Then, when you've dealt with the interruption, the resume plan will help you engage more quickly. Finally, of course, as a leader, be aware of how different people in your team think and work. Deeper thinking people, often introverts, will struggle much more with quick questions, where extroverts may find the interruption energising. The theme of being aware of your team members comes out in this week's discussion with Claire as well. So let's go to that now. Hi Claire, how are you doing? I'm very well today, thanks John. Brilliant. It's so good to be talking to you. And we're going to talk, obviously, a lot about highly sensitive people. We're going to talk about introversion a little bit, because I see, and you see when we were talking off air, quite a lot of overlaps, which is really interesting. But just before we do that, are you an introvert or an extrovert? And probably more importantly, what does that mean to you? I would base my answer on a test, and I don't remember where the test came from a few years ago. It showed that I was just towards the extrovert side, but quite in the middle. So an ambivert, um, but really towards the extrovert side. And I can tell you my daughter would agree. 
because when I used to, we used to go for walks in the neighborhood and she would say, mom, mom, is this a walk or is this a talk? Because I would stop <laughs> and chat with, the, with anybody who was out on the front step. Oh, yeah. I, yes, yeah. So HSP, what is it? It's a trait. It's a genetic trait and way of being in the world, which really encompasses ab about four different things, as Dr. Elaine Aaron, who identified the trait in 1996, would say. I can go through what those are, but overall, it's basically that we have a nervous system that is very highly responsive, highly perceptive. And we're, we're basically, I, I, the analogy I like to make is think of a meerkat. So you think of that animal on its hind legs, standing, sniffing, smelling, listening, paying attention to everything that's, that's around so that the rest of the mob can eat, sleep, frolic, do whatever they want to do because somebody's on guard. You love it, so. Well, a highly sensitive person basically has their senses on point all the time, which you can imagine. It must be draining. Like, exactly. How would I know if I was an HSP? You're sort of bouncing off Elaine Aaron's DOES model, which is depth of processing. So we deeply think about things which can be great or it can be analysis paralysis if we get stuck. So depth of processing, overstimulation, which to your point can be exhausting because we're, we're picking up so much. Empathy and emotional reactivity are two parts of her E. And then S is sensitivity to stimuli. And if I can, I think I would just say it's easy to remember as seed. You've got this seed within you. And if I can switch the acronym now, SEED, think of your sensitivity. E, think of your empathy and your emotional reactivity, because those are two powerful and sometimes over displayed really tricky things. And D is the depth of processing. So sensitivity, empathy, emotional reactivity, and depth of processing. And I like the idea of SEED because it's within you and it can be the source of such goodness um, if we if we really learn how to express it well i like the model because again if i was a leader or a manager and i had a team it would help me to understand if one or more i guess of my team were also hsps but in a work setting is it a good thing or a bad thing to have these these people with this trait in your team well overall it's a fantastic thing because what the research will show that we have higher than average performance reviews. What it depends on though, is the culture and the space that we're invited to be in. While we have these great performance reviews, we're also the quickest to burn out. So you have, we have to be taken care of. We have to have an environment which is not taxing. So if we think of an open concept office and you think of somebody whose nervous system is, is picking up on everything, and is going to be exhausted, you better complement that with some rest spaces, some quiet places where someone could go. There's a similarity here with introversion. There can be an overstimulation from human contact and we not, might need quiet places to retreat and think and not have so much human contact energy stimulating us. Who invented the office, the open plan office? Never was it an introvert's nice link. But how similar are the two things? What's, what is this overlap? Yeah, so the research will show that in the highly sensitive population, we see 70% are introverted, 30% are extroverted. So there is a split, but it's heavily weighted to our friends, the introverts. Interesting. Does it show what percentage of introverts are HSP? I have not. Maybe you could help me with that, actually, because what percentage of people in the general public are introverted? The one I use is 30 to 40 percent, although it's like lots of like lots of things. Where do you define the cutoff? Because as you rightly said, you put you put yourself in the middle. Yeah. Some people might say it's one point to the left of the middle, therefore it's in it. So it's hard to say, but it's really hard to say. So if we look at the highly sensitive population, that's 20% of all people. It shows up in about one in five people, the genetic trait for this high sensitivity. Sometimes it's also known, you might hear it as sensory processing sensitivity, which is different than sensory processing disorder. I don't wanna get things muddled, but if people hear different terms, I just wanna be clear, this is, this is deemed a trait, not a disorder, because just like introversion, it's a perfectly 
natural, acceptable, embraceable way of showing up. There is nothing to be fixed about the personality. Like it asks all sorts of cynical questions like, does introversion really exist? Is it real? Is there a biochemical neuroscientific proof of it? To which the answer is yes. How about HSP? Well, yeah, there's been a lot more research since 1996 when, when Dr. Aaron wrote the book, The Highly Sensitive Person. The research will show, for example, things like the highly sensitive brain has more mirror neurons than the average brain. And so there's, there is research that supports the different traits and the way they show up and actual brain you know, imagery. And that's where we know that there is a genetic component to this. It's really interesting too, because we will see in the autism community and people with ADHD and other learning disabilities um, that there is often high sensitivity present with that. So I really like looking at this whole area of neurodivergent brains. And again, there's a continuum and there are different ways of showing up. There's within autism, there's hypersensitivity and hyposensitivity. Really? And, right? So I, I really like the idea of trying to recognize that productivity is personal for the individual and that we need to think about instead of looking for a label necessarily, what are you? Do you have introvert written on your t-shirt? Where's your tattoo? Where, how do you, oh, how do you? I'm not going to you tell know? you now because the audience <laughs> will get put off by it. <laughs> it's, but how do you identify? And rather I would like leaders to think about Gosh, I remember somebody saying they, you know, they found the office really busy. Maybe they would really benefit from a quieter space. And so we're going to bring some quiet space. We're going to allow for or encourage and offer uh, headphones, noise canceling headphones for the group. What could you do to notice or anticipate somebody's challenge? And instead of looking for a label, which is, as, as we were discussing, kind of hard to know, even within a label where somebody mm -hmm. falls but to offer some suggestions and make room for different ways of working and different spaces for working, which really supports someone's productivity. So, so if leaders understood HSP a bit more, that would allow them to anticipate or remove barriers that might be there that they didn't know. They didn't, don't even need to categorize the people. They've just started to think about those barriers. So they've built a more inclusive workspace which would also work for introverts, of course. It really would. I, mm. Yeah, and I, I think back to Susan Cain's book, Quiet. And she was, in that book, she talks about the highly sensitive person quite significantly as well. And I think for many people, that would be the first place they've heard of it. So I'm on a mission to really invite this more tender world because I think our busy, loud, attention-seeking world has really favored the extroverts and the, the people who are not sensitive for their environment, but it's exhausting, right? So how can we invite a more tender world? The world's been designed to get the best from the most amongst us, but really what we want to do is create an environment that invites the most from some of the best minds, and we've been marginalizing those. Great way to look at it, absolutely. If leaders had a better understanding of HSP and introversion in an organization, they would be able to get more of the team engaged, get better answers, get more of that, as you said, the divergent minds. And that's what makes us rich as a society and is rich as a team. The noisy ones are the quick answer. Mm. You know, there's somebody who's like, got, got something right off, but the deep processor might be connecting all the dots and really have something valuable to offer. What it requires is patience. Inclusivity requires patience whether it's someone with a hearing challenge, a visual challenge, a temperament difference, we need patients to invite those contributions. And that's something in a hustle culture, which is really tricky. So I'm, I'm hoping we move away from hustle culture to the slow cooker. I like that one, Claire. I often talk about the extrovert bias in the world, and now mm -hmm. I've just got a new one, the hustle culture. I like that. What one tip would you offer a non-introvert, perhaps a manager who has HSP in their team? I invite all my leaders to do is ask, what do you need to succeed? So if you see somebody struggling, you can, and hopefully you're noticing, so tune into your own noticing powers to, to sense 
Maybe what somebody's not saying, is it a moment of hesitation? What's showing up as potentially a clue that something is not working well? And ask, what do you need to succeed? I think honestly, that's got to be part of every onboarding conversation. How do you, John Baker, how do you thrive? What's the environment in which you do your best work? Imagine if those questions could be there. Isn't that a great way of doing it? If we asked all of those things and more to the point, not just asked them, but really listened to the answer at the onboarding stage. Give us a tip for an introvert who is an HSP. So as an introvert, you know where your energy comes from and you know you need to preserve your energy. As an HSP, if you're not familiar with the, the trait in depth, it's really worth learning about those seed qualities and to step into your superpower of great noticing, great thinking, high empathy, and to manage some of that emotional reactivity potential. You might, one example is people might notice that they're easily triggered and they might feel really on the cusp of unleashing their thoughts. So to build some skill, and I, there's a process I have for this too, where we're noticing what we're feeling and moving towards nurturing a really productive response. And as an introvert, to do the utmost to take care of yourself. That's something we all should do anyway, all of us in society, I think nowadays, take more care of ourselves, but especially those that are going to get more drained by the, the hustle culture. So Claire, how can people get back in touch with you? Let me start with the Happy Space Pod because this is an initiative, really a movement to create and inspire this more tender world. And so it includes an online uh, community, which is, is free to join. And that's at happyspacepod.com. I want it to be a really fun, positive, energizing place for people to be and feel understood. So Happy Space Pod is the online community. And you can find all of this at clairekumar.com. Fantastic. It's been brilliant to talk, Claire. And I know that we could probably go on talking for hours, but unfortunately, we've run out of time. Thank you very much for spending some time with us today. What a great pleasure it was, John. Thank you. What would you like to know about introversion in business? This week's question comes from Andrea, who asked, how can I be better at managing introverts? Thank you, Andrea. It's something I cover every week, but let's go for the skinny. Here's my quick top two. Understand the benefits of engaging each member of your team. That's not just about the introverts, although they're often the misunderstood ones. If you don't focus on the benefits of an action, you're less likely to go through with the actions. Number two, create an environment where different communication styles are respected. That may be too large an item for a quick action, but the first step towards it is not. Give everybody in your team the space to answer. Don't answer for them and don't let somebody else do so. If somebody doesn't get allowed the space to answer, you're training them that their answer isn't wanted and that leads to disengagement. And number three, generalised action plans are great. Even better is showing you understand and asking them how you can help. So ask. I know that sometimes I jump in too quickly or other extroverted weakness of your choice. I'd love you to help me overcome it as I know your different style could really complement mine. I hope that helped, Andrea. What question would you like answered on the show? Whether you want to be on the show or just have your question answered like Andrea, go to activateyourintrovert.co.uk. There's a box there to ask a question. You could also follow on Facebook and discuss the answers at the show's page, Activate Your Introvert. I'm John Baker. Thank you for listening. I hope you found it useful. There's a new episode every Thursday at activateyourintrovert.co.uk and your favourite podcast provider. Till then, go be introversial, activating your introverts, building your business. Your business.